rolling. Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast. The Real Estate Investing Rookies Podcast, episode number 12, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Josh Koth. And I'm Jack Haas. And here at REI Rookies, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. Let's get into some real estate investing. Yes, this week we're going to start a four-part series around acquisition strategies. Yep, we're going to start with the MLS this week because that's by far the most popular uh, and widespread strategy. Number two will be FISBOs for sale by owners. Number three, direct mail bandit signs and other strategies for targeting off-market properties. And number four will be direct referrals and drive-bys and networking. Um, So any way you find a property directly. So let's get into the first acquisition strategy, the MLS. So first of all, for those that don't or may not know, what is the MLS? Multiple listing service. This is where the uh, broker and real estate agents would have access. And when you list a property for sale, uh, your property gets listed on the service. I think most people are going to be familiar with it through uh, Zillow, Realtor.com, or your local real estate agent. Yep. And, you know, this is how most people buy and sell properties. In fact, I I don't know what percentage it is, but I'm sure it's over 90% of properties get listed on the MLS and sold through the MLS. So, you know, even if you're not, you might not find the best deeply discounted deals on the MLS, it's a strategy you want to utilize because that's where most properties are. So you'd be, it'd be kind of a shame to miss out on that large amount of properties, right? Over 90% of the properties bought and sold. Right. And, and what I think is important is don't, don't remove this as a strategy. I know a lot of you know a lot of other podcasts are all talk about finding those properties that are off market. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, frankly, we've had quite a bit of luck uh, through the MLS. So the main point is, since over ninety percent of all properties are bought and sold on the MLS, it's not something you should or can ignore, right? Yeah, and I think a, a big thing is is to find that right real estate agent or broker in which to work with and make them a team member. Uh, One thing that we definitely looked for is an agent that also does investing themselves so they get it. Yep. I think that's important. They need to be in tune with the needs of investors. Somebody who's going to be writing some lowball offers, somebody who may be looking at more properties, somebody who understands that the properties might need some cosmetic updates or even significant upgrades and updates and fixing rehab, all those things uh, might be needed. And the the needs of an investor are different from someone looking for a home to live in, right? So you're looking for a type of personality that can work with uh, that type of person. Yeah. And somebody who isn't afraid to submit those lowball deals in writing. Um, you are going to run into some agents who would rather call and float the uh, deal by the other agent or the selling agent. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't want them to do that. You actually want them to deliver that offer. Yep, that's that's a very important point. Uh, Offers submitted in writing are psychologically uh, much more, have much more gravitas. So that's, and they receive more consideration. So, you always want to put things in writing. So you have to find an agent willing to submit those offers on your behalf to the MLS. And one strategy you can use when you're uh, getting hooked up with real estate agents is get on some auto email lists. This is something that we do. You know, we, we set our criteria, our range of asking price, uh, amount of bedrooms, those things, and we get they can filter out all the properties that meet your criteria and send you a daily um, email that contains links to all those properties. So you'll never miss one when it comes on the market in that meets your criteria. And it's a great way to track properties where deals fall through. And we've, we've had some success on that as well. Uh, one of the properties that we closed on last fall, uh, the deal fell through. And we were able to uh, grab that property pretty quickly when we saw it come back on the market. And that was because it showed up 
in an auto email um, <clears throat> as an as a listing, or I think they're even flagged as back on the market, or I may have just recognized the address. But when you do it enough, you'll start to recognize houses. And, and if you keep good notes and a good spreadsheet of all the properties that you're working with, you can go back and check. And sure enough, it had been one we had placed an offer on, it had been rejected. And now we saw a new opportunity because it, it came as a relisting on the MLS, we were notified via email. And so we're able to actually work out a deal and purchase that property when we may not have had we not seen that auto email come through. And when it gets relisted too, um, it kind of softens up the seller a bit. Exactly. That's a really good time to submit an offer that may have seemed ridiculous to them a few months ago. But when they have a deal fall through, um, they start to get a little bit more realistic about what they're asking. And, you know, there can some more motivation involved. A couple more months have gone by. They've made more mortgage payments. Uh, it's just costing them money. And they might be much more motivated to get that property sold. And that can weaken their position as far as price. So when we approach the MLS uh properties we are sticking to our formula we don't move from it at all and again we're just going to remind you that that asking price is pretty much meaningless it's more of a suggestion than anything else we really stick to our numbers and those are the type of offers we're going to have uh, even around the mls listings yeah, and that's why it's so important to know your neighborhoods know your areas of town know what um the property could rent for or what you could sell it for if it was in good condition so you got to know your comps and you got to know your rents and if you know those numbers then you can work backwards from there into a purchase price and then you can just submit those offers with no emotion you know we call it being an offer bot uh, there's no emotion involved here you're not going to live in these properties you're not uh, in love with them sometimes we don't even see them we just uh you know we'll, we'll say write an offer on this and you can put a clause in in the contract that states you know you need your partner has to view the property or you need some uh, an inspection contingency you can put a lot of contingencies in these offers so you don't necessarily have to see them all either we we typically will look through everything locally um, just as a way to estimate the rehab costs because that factors into our offer price but you can get pretty good at doing it without even actually stepping foot in the property and uh, so we sometimes even do kind of a brute force attack uh, even setting aside a day or two where we're just basically pounding through the listings. And it's all about numbers. Um, we find that 2 to 5% of the things that we are looking at and putting offers in may actually get accepted. And we're always looking a way to raise that percentage to try to find ways to get more offers accepted. Yeah, so if you have a goal as a company or as a real estate investor, as an individual of the amount of properties you'd like to acquire, um, then you, it's just a question of, okay, if, if one out of every 10 gets accepted, then if I want 10 properties in a year, I need to submit 100 offers, right? I mean, it's just a numbers game at that point. So, you know, we're trying to purchase a property a month or so. That's kind of our, our, our cruising goal. And if we want to do that, we just got to work backwards from the percentage that get accepted and submit that many offers. So two to five percent of those getting accepted will yield us one property, you know, that we acquire per month. So obviously, you know, if, if there's any way you can up the percentage that are getting accepted, you want to do that. And it's always a trade off. And what we try to do is make our offers as attractive as possible because the unattractive portion of our offer is the typically the price right we're kind of beating them up on the price because that's what we need to get in order for the property to be a profitable transaction on our part so <clears throat> in order to soften that blow and make the give the offer have them or have the seller give the offer some consideration there's things you can do to make it more attractive uh, number one being make it an all cash offer so if there's any way you can come to the seller with an all cash offer that significantly improves your chances. And, you know, I'm selling a property this week, and I can tell you what a difference that makes when you get 
two offers side by side. One is, you know, FHA finance, possibly one is conventional financing and one is all cash. I would even take, and I've done this, I've accepted a lower offer that was all cash versus one that was conventional financing just because of the time frame you're talking about, the percentage chance that it's going to close without any issues. Um, that's a huge peace of mind item for sellers. Um, so all, if you can make an offer all cash, that's a huge benefit to your seller. Another one is no inspection or even uh, reducing the amount of contingencies that you might have on your offer. Uh, sometimes our contingency is simply upon approval of our par- of our partner. Um, yep, and that's just basically to give us some time to assess the property. Um, but typically, we write our offers with no all cash, no inspection needed, no inspection contingency. And that really is a differentiator because most, and I don't know what percentage, but I would say the vast majority of offers that are submitted have an inspection contingency. Most people want to have an inspection done before they buy a house. Well, we've just trusted our ability to estimate rehab costs and you know, if we've walked through a property especially, then we have no problem submitting it with no inspection contingency. It's a way you can really give the seller more peace of mind that you're actually going to close uh, because the inspection is where a lot of deals fall apart. And things that an inspection would flag typically wouldn't scare us off anyways because we're confident enough in our abilities to an- our ability to analyze a property um, that we feel comfortable writing offers with no inspection contingency. So that's a great way to make your offer more attractive. And sometimes when a deal falls through, particularly on the MLS, there is a small chance, I'm not going to say this is going to happen altogether, is that you can get some insight on what some of those uh, problems may be before you submit that second offer. Um, kind of giving you an option and an idea of what your uh, rehab cost might be. Yeah, a lot of times you can kind of play some inside baseball and find out, you know, what were the issues that caused the previous deal to fall through. And if if anyone can give you that information, perhaps your agent can find out from their agent, you know, they'll be more willing to share. Because if, if they're transparent and upfront about the things that are going on, um, it just makes everybody, f- you know, have more peace of mind and we're not afraid of things that need to be fixed, right? It's just, it's just cost. So just tell us what's, what, what killed the deal. And if there's a way we can work out a deal where we're happy, we can get those items fixed. Maybe we can share in the costs of that. Maybe we're willing to take on the cost of that fully, you know, for a reduced purchase price, you know, which is basically the same thing as making them pay for it anyways. Um, but you know, any, points you can use as leverage to get that price down to where it's profitable, uh, you should definitely do that. And, it, you know, removing the inspection contingency is a great way to make that. Another point is to write in your offer the quickest close date possible. And this is great for failed landlords or people who are retiring and the property is sitting vacant. All it's doing is costing them money. So if you're Offer, submitting an offer that would typically, if with conventional financing, be four to six weeks out at the earliest. Um, and you can come in and close in 10 days to two weeks. That's a huge advantage to the seller. Um, it's costing them less money. Maybe they can, won't have to pay another mortgage payment or you know insurance taxes, all the carrying costs they have associated with the property. If you can alleviate a whole month's worth of that by closing in two weeks instead of six to eight weeks, um, that's a great advantage. So to summarize, the MLS can be a great way to find investment properties. It's something you definitely don't want to ignore since most properties are going to be listed on the MLS. So we want to find a great real estate agent to add to your team, preferably one that's an investor themselves. We want to get on auto email lists. Make sure you see every property that comes across the MLS. Have your formulas figured out. Remember, the asking price is meaningless. You figure out what you can offer, and that's what you offer. You know, you need to know your neighborhood so you can figure those formulas out. What can properties rent for? What are the comps? What are the after repair values in those neighborhoods? Remember, be an offer bot. Submit all those offers with no emotion involved. Stick to your formulas and don't deviate. Remember, it's a numbers game. If you have one to two to five percent 
offer is accepted, then you need to be making 100 offers if you want two to five deals. So just figure out how you can make that many offers and find an agent that's willing to submit those on your behalf. Also, make your offer as attractive as possible to get the highest acceptance rate. The ways you can do that are make your offers all cash, remove your inspection contingency, and have the closing date be the soonest possible, especially if the property is vacant. Uh, you'll see some great motivation on sellers around that point. So don't ignore the MLS. Most properties are going to be listed on it. It can be a great source of real estate investing profits. So moving on to the lesson of the week, we are going to emphasize the importance of referral leads and running them down. Yep. So this is a great way, and we'll talk about these in an upcoming episode in our acquisition strategies series. When we get to episode four in this series, I'm talking about direct referrals, networking, and drive-bys. Um, and as an example, just kind of as a teaser for that, we have people come to us now because we're known in the community as real estate investors. People will come up, and we ask for this too, in some networking groups that we're in, we'll say, do you see any properties that look like they're abandoned? Uh, have the grass hasn't been mowed in a while? Um, send me the address. That's all I need. And we incentivize them by saying that we'll pay a referral fee too if we end up purchasing the property and doing a deal on it. So it really takes no none of their time to just snap a quick picture, text me the address, and if they get like 500 bucks for it or something, that's a great incentive for doing almost nothing. And the trick to that is you make sure to run those leads down, right? Look up, look up who owns the property now. Is there a way to reach out to them? Can you find them anywhere? Uh, is the property listed for sale? There's been several where, um, you know, and people, when they're submitting these referrals to you, they might not know the game of real estate at all. It may be listed on the MLS already. They just don't know. Well, that's fine. You know, we can still make an offer on it, as we were just talking about. Uh, we're not afraid of MLS properties at all. If it's not on the MLS, great. That's great as well. Maybe we can do an off-market deal. And there's a lot less competition there. So we'll always look up who, who owns the property and is there a way we can contact them. We've even gone so far as we had one deal uh, referred to us. It was a property that a gentleman thought looked abandoned. Um, I looked up who owned it. Couldn't find a way to reach out to them directly short of just mailing to that address. And our, our real estate agent actually located a relative, found them on Facebook and messaged them there. And, you know, we ended up not being able to do a deal, but that was a great example of the extent you should go to, to at least chase the lead down, run down the dead end and either do a deal or get told no or you know, there's some other, other roadblock, but make sure you push it as far as you can. That's really the key. So with that, we're going on to the coach's corner, a personal development tip or book or quote. Uh, this week, I'm going to recommend the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Josh, have you read this one? I have not. I've heard this book recommended many times. I've listened to a few episodes of Tim Ferriss's podcast, which is pretty interesting too. He has a lot of engaging, interesting guests on there. And he really is kind of a master of outsourcing and automation. Is that really the the crux of the book? Yeah. And in fact, I'm going to say it's, it is a lot of that type of information. And I, I'm going to, even after reading it, um, I, you even question like how, how much some of this can actually be in, in practice mm -hmm. regarding real estate or, or any kind of real, you know, business. But, um, what I think there's, it's important is it definitely helps you think of alternatives and, and workflows and starts to quit. You start to question like, is, is this the best process? Right, or is this the best use of my time, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So uh, it might be part of that mindset shift that we've referred to in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the end, uh, taking the time to look through this book, uh, if it even gives you a couple of ideas or com concepts to improve your workflow, helps make things more efficient, or shift time to money-generating activities, I think it's well worth the investment of your time. 
Yeah, that sounds great. And, you know, that can be applied to real estate in a number of ways and a couple of ways that we've already implemented. One being filtering leads that come in through our direct mail campaigns. You know, we outsource that because that's not the best use of our time is filtering those phone calls. Another way is, you know, on doing rehabs, you know, we're not the best at doing most things in a rehab. So, and plus a lot of those rehab tasks are very time consuming. So we've learned to hire out those things so we can be spending our time finding more deals, which is real. That's the highest and best use of our time. So we have implemented a couple of those strategies just organically. Um, but I think I'm definitely going to going to read or listen to this book. I, I like listening to books on audible personally. Um, when I'm driving, that's kind of when I get my my book reading, listening in. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check this one out because I've heard it mentioned by so many people. And that's another little tip, you know, personal development tip. When you hear a bunch of different people mention a certain book or author, it's probably worth checking them out. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, no question. Um, and you'll see that uh, a lot of the books that we've recommended are likely ones that you've heard of in the past, and now we're reinforcing it. Yeah, we're not, you know, trying to, f we're not out going out of our way to find weird, out of left field type information. You know, a whole other concept we like to talk about is we're, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're just going to find out what works and replicate that. So if a, a lot of other people are referencing the same material and they've benefited from it, uh, odds are good that you would benefit from that as well, too. So, so again, we're going to ask you for some feedback. How is the audio quality? Would you like us to focus on a specific topic? Or if you have any questions that we can try to answer, you can uh, send that feedback directly on Facebook, our website, or Twitter at REI Rookies. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps us find other rookie investors out there and hopefully get them some valuable information as well. And remember, get off the bench and get into the game. We'll see you next time. This sucks. Hang on. Since <laughs> as least as less. No, I'm going to have to edit that out. <laughs> Chirp. Chirp. <laughs> mm, son of a... I was doing so good. You just kept spiraling I a know, little bit I at know. the end there. Just, <laughs> you were doing so good. I know. And remember, get off the bench! <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun having a partnership. That's sad ass to come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been waiting for that the whole episode. That the whole episode.